So I gotta confess that I was really torn about whether or not I wanted to go see The Iron Claw because being a bit older as a wrestling fan, not as old as some, but older than many others, I've certainly lived through uh, a big share of like wrestling tragedies over the decades, right? And one thing that's always been tough about professional wrestling is that death is a big part of the story. And, you know, how much tragedy porn do you really need, right? And to me, sitting there thinking about, I know the Von Erich family story. I know about the Von Erich family curse, the tragedy. Like, do I really need to sit through Hollywood trying to tell that story for a couple of hours? Eh, you know. But I ultimately decided I'll, I'll go see it and see how they did. And the thing that I fear with Hollywood taking on a story like this is that they'll try to tell too much story in two hours. That inevitably leads to a whole lot of time compression, omissions, inaccuracies, and that can be really hard, especially if you're familiar with the story. Somebody that's not that's just casually going to see this you know, won't be bothered by this very much. But I can certainly venture a guess that somebody's enjoyment or non-enjoyment of this movie could in no small part be due to how much they're familiar with the world-class wrestling story and how much they're familiar with the Von Erich family story and the Von Erich family tragedy. I have no doubt about that. Here's what I will say is that time compression, omissions, and inaccuracies can sometimes be annoying, but they can be okay as long as they don't overwhelmingly change the narrative if they don't change the story and my thing with the iron claw is that it really to me in some respects towed the line between historical accuracy and frankly historical fiction because there were so many key inaccuracies so many key omissions that it almost changes the narrative there are certainly some things that this movie got right to, but there's a lot that's wrong with it. That doesn't automatically mean it was a bad movie, but I'm going to talk about those inaccuracies, those omissions, what this movie got right, and my ultimate thoughts on it. Now, in terms of the inaccuracies for The Iron Claw, uh, some of these matter a whole lot more than others do. Uh, first, it wasn't called World Class Championship Wrestling until 1982. It was big time wrestling before that. Something that if you know, you're like, oh, come on. You can't yeah, get that little detail right, but whatever. Um, one that bothered me a little bit more than I think would bother other people is that on Kevin's first date with Pam, he wouldn't be breaking kayfabe like that. He wouldn't even be broaching that subject. He wouldn't be smartening up this chick that he doesn't know from a hole in the ground. That, to me, is doing a major disservice to just how protective of the business these guys were back 40 years ago. It is hard for us to fathom in the 2023 world of wrestling shoot interviews and work shoots and all this other crap that kayfabe was a thing that was real. <laughs> And these guys fought tooth and nail to protect the business. So for him to be sitting there and even entertaining that conversation with Pam on a first date, give me a break. Um, also, the way it kind of portrays Kerry Von Erich and when he came into wrestling for his dad and world class, he was already wrestling by the time he was 18 years old. Like he debuted in 1978. You know, he, was, he was already wrestling as a teenager. Also, speaking of Kerry Von Erich, he was 6'2", 240, 250 pounds. Like, he was a fucking muscular Greek god. You know, as much as you talk about uh, the Ultimate Warrior, you remember a lot of people think the Ultimate Warrior died in 1993 because Kerry Von Erich died in 1993, which points to how many people mistakenly think that Kerry Von Erich was a freaking Ultimate Warrior. He was the modern-day warrior, and later the Texas Tornado in WWF, but people actually believe this shit because he was a fucking Greek god. 
He wasn't five foot seven like Jeremy Allen White was. Now there are other things I thought Jeremy Allen White nailed with his um, portrayal of Kerry Von Erich, but physically, like it's hard to believe this. You know, I'm looking, and Kerry Von Erich is the shortest brother when he was six foot two. He certainly wasn't six foot seven like David was, but he wasn't a midget. So that was kind of kind of took me out of it a little bit. Um, I know a lot of people already talked about this, so I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, Kerry didn't get into the motorcycle crash the night he won the NWA World Championship at the Parade of Champions uh, David Von Erich tribute show. That happened a couple years later. That's time compression, and that's almost inevitable when you're talking about a movie like this and the amount of material it's trying to cover in the period of time that it does. So I could live about that with that. Uh, the Ric Flair portrayal. That was just fucking god awful. Everybody's been hammering on this one, and they should. This was bad. To a casual person that's not familiar with wrestling, that may not know who Ric Flair is, they might buy it. No, it was fucking bad. How in the hell do you mess up? Woo! Like how do you how do you mess that up? Unbelievable. Um, next thing, I just call bullshit on this one. Would Carrie have shown up to a family Christmas in 1990, 1991 with a girlfriend when he was married at the time? More on the brothers and their marriages in a moment, but really? He's showing up with Tanya? Did that really happen? Especially when he was married? And then later on in the movie, he's like, I don't even know who, I don't even remember who that was. Dude was married at the time. What the fuck, movie? Um, Next. World Class Championship Wrestling did not get a television deal with ESPN until 1988. It is shown way out of sequence in this movie. Way out of sequence. Like, it was being portrayed that this happened in 1981, 1982. Not true. However, this is a bit of time compression and also a way to make people understand um, because your audience may not understand the power of World Class's television syndication deal that it had in the 80s when it was one of the, most, the highest watched shows in the entire country. So if you have to say, hey, the television was really big for world class, but the way we make people understand that is by saying it was ESPN, fine. It's not accurate, but it does at least hint at, at least hint at how big world class was during that period of time in the 80s. Uh, Mike Von Erich was not injured in the Sportatorium. He was injured on a tour in Israel. Um, also, when it comes to Mike, he didn't injure his shoulder and then immediately go into toxic shock syndrome at the hospital. Like this was something that happened later after he came back stateside. Uh, that said, yet another thing I think of as time compression. So it's not fully accurate, fully inaccurate. These things happen, but they're just happening in a very compressed way. Um, also, Mike Von Erich did not die on the ranch. He did die of an overdose. He did die zipped up in his sleeping bag, but it was at a reservoir and it took a few days for him to be found. Again, I think of that as more of time compression than an egregious inaccuracy. Uh, one thing I always thought was really odd as you got towards the end of the movie was the piece around Kevin Von Erich and Fritz Von Erich having a back and forth about selling world class to Jerry Jarrett. That one really didn't make any sense to me because Kevin didn't sell world class to Jerry Jarrett in the USWA. Fritz von Erich did. I don't know where the hell this comes from because in fact, Kevin didn't want to do it, even sued Jarrett at one point in time and eventually tried to break away from the USWA before world class ultimately truly went under. So why the choice of this part of the story? It got the dynamics between Kevin and Fritz at this time totally and completely wrong. Um, lastly, in terms of inaccuracies, and there are more inaccuracies I could touch on, but I can't touch on them all. These are just some of the more significant ones I thought of. Kevin did not find his brother Kerry after he shot himself in the chest on the farm. Fritz did. That's not a small thing. Also, when you think about omissions, you know, this is something that could fit in the omissions category. You could have told a different layer of story there of how what really happened was Carrie Von Erich came to the ranch 
hugged his dad Fritz, told him that he loved him. His dad was sitting there pouring concrete. Before that, Kevin had called and said, hey, Carrie's not in a good place. You need to look out for him. And his dad goes back to pouring concrete. This all happens and Carrie goes and shoots himself. And then Fritz is like, where the hell is my son? And goes and finds him on the freaking ranch. So it's an accurate, but you could say it represents a bit of an amalgamation because Kevin did find his brother, Chris, after he had shot himself in the head in 1991. So more about Chris in a moment or two. So those are the biggest inaccuracies that kind of stand out to me in terms of the omissions. And some of these, again, are worse and more egregious than others. I just hinted at perhaps the single most egregious omission of this entire movie, but let's run through them because there are certainly many. Uh, it didn't really capture the intimacy of the sportatorium. It did make me feel like, in some respects, I was watching a sh match at the old sportatorium, but not fully. Additionally, this movie really failed to capture just how big of sex symbols and heartthrobs and all American kids, the Von Erich boys, really were. Like these guys were being sexually assaulted, more or less, every single time they come down the freaking ramp in the sportatorium with these girls sitting there grabbing them around the neck, kissing them on the cheek, kissing them on the mouth, probably grabbing their cock and everything else. Like this movie actually did an injustice to how big of stars and heartthrobs and matinee idols the Von Erich boys were. And maybe you say, hey, you've got to be careful because you do this in the movie and you do too over the top. Fans and viewers would go away not believing it. The reality is it would have made it a lot more accurate and true to life if they would have pictured, shown that and illustrated that and portrayed that because that was true. It also, I felt like, didn't truly capture how significant of an impact the Von Erichs, the Von Erich family, world-class championship wrestling had a professional wrestling in the 1980s. Like you feel like you're hearing more about Fritz and his beef with the NWA, which was an organization he was a member of, and he certainly had some clout in, hence why Kerry even won the NWA World Championship from Flair in 84. That didn't happen by accident. He, he insisted that that title chase was going to happen. Fritz had some damn clout. So to sit there and make it seem like this was all about Fritz trying to get his spot because while they were very accurate about how he was living vicariously through his boys, more on that in a moment, the whole notion of um, he, he was so mad at the NWA, man, he was making big money, right? Like, that's, that's my thing. World class changed the way in a lot of ways how professional wrestling was presented on television it changed, you know, the, the business in terms of the television exposure it's got, how they did television, so many things. And this movie barely scratches the surface on that. And I understand that's not what the movie is about. And I understand I'm not watching a movie about world class. I'm watching a movie about the Von Erich brothers and the Von Erich family. But I'm just saying, you did throw some of the world class stuff in there. It'd be nice if he got some of that put in. It didn't capture just how huge these guys were in the Dallas, Texas area. Like when the kids used to do things back when they were kids, like it would be shown on local TV. Like these guys were Dallas as much as anybody else. They were on similar footing with the Dallas Cowboys in that time. And you might think I'm speaking in hyperbole. I'm not. I'm speaking in reality. These guys were beloved figures in Dallas, Texas. And this movie really didn't do that any justice. There was no Gary Hart that I could recall seeing in that movie. That was a guy that was a pretty big part of world class. But again, I can understand that omission. It's not about world class. It's about the Von Erich family. This next omission, though, they weren't totally omitted, but there was so little about the Freebirds. Like you saw them, and they referenced them a little bit. But you think about the Von Erichs oftentimes... The first thing you think about is all the brothers dying. And the second thing you think about is their feud with the Freebirds. And the Freebirds were big players in this movie to almost an uncomfortable degree, in my opinion, because they were much bigger deals in the story of world class, the story of the Von Erich family, than was led on here. That was not a good omission. That was a bad one. Um, next thing, 
they omitted, and I totally understand, and I'm glad they kept this out, some of the rumors about David Von Erich's cause of death. He died from acute enteritis. That's what the autopsy said. That's what I'm rolling with. They avoided some of the alternate slash conspiracy theories about did he die due to an overdose and Bruiser Brody hid all the pills before the cops in Japan got there. Did he die of a heart attack? Did he die of this? It wasn't needed. I'm glad they stayed away from it. Uh, what I wasn't so glad that they stayed away from, because I actually feel like this is a really important part of the Von Erich family history, as, long, as well as world class, was the fake Von Erich, Lance Von Erich, and how that tied into everything. Instead of telling that part of the story and how this was a significant thing at the time, and it really started to erode the wrestling fans' faith and belief and trust in the Von Erich family because they knew they were being lied to and the Von Erich family and world class kept lying to the fans. You see MJF for a few seconds in the ring and that's about it. Like this was not a nothing. This was a big deal in the mid 80s. And this was one of those seminal moments you point to in the inevitable downturn and degradation of the world class brand. And it got almost no play here. That's crazy to me. There's an there's a important story you've got to tell there. It also, like I said, failed to show how the fans started to lose belief in the Von Erichs due to their issues. The Lance Von Erich stuff. Now you're lying to the fans. You do work them, but don't fucking lie to them. But then, you know, as the brothers start passing away, it's David, and then it's Mike in 87. You know, it's Carrie with the accident in 86. It's all this other stuff. The Lance Von Erich stuff. Like the fans started to lose their belief in the Von Erichs. And they don't really mention that here. And in a two-hour movie, I suppose there wasn't time for this because they want to focus on the juiciest part, which is all the brothers dying. Um, what's weird, though, is that they didn't show Carrie's accident. Like, they alluded to it, certainly. But they, I guess they didn't want to show him crashing into the back of a cop, parked cop car. I guess. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but there was also no mention of David's marriages because he was married twice. You know, also when you talk about the Von Erich family tragedy, you don't mention the fact that he had a kid that passed away from SIDS at like two months old, three months old, something like that back in 1978. Uh, there's no mention or reference to Carrie Von Erich being married and divorced in 92. His kids, you know, including Lacey, there's no mention of Carrie Von Erich's legal troubles, you know, multiple drug arrests. Um, being a driver of his suicide, you know, that, that's not a small thing, right? Because the thing that ultimately pushed him over the edge, in my opinion, I think of the opinion of many others, was that he was just getting charged with new drug charges and he was already on parole from a previous set of drug charges and this set of drug charges was likely going to put him in prison for an extended period of time. Like, that's not a nothing. That's a significant driver for somebody to want to say, fuck it all, I don't want to be around anymore, I want to join my brothers. They hit the part about Kerry wanting to join his brothers, that's pretty well documented in him saying that to a number of people the last couple of years of his life. But one of the big ultimate cherries on the Sunday, if you will, that put him at that point were the drug problems and the drug arrests and the potential prison time that he was facing. And I'm really surprised that Hollywood didn't include that here. I really am. There was an allusion to, you know, a divide in the marriage between Fritz and Doris. You know, that scene towards the end of the movie when Fritz comes in and asks what's for dinner. And Doris is like, I'm not hungry. And she's sitting there painting. You know, but Fritz and Doris divorced, I think it was in 1991 or 1992. I don't remember the exact year. But they actually divorced after over 40 years of marriage. So they got their marriage right. In some respects, it's just they omitted the fact that they actually got divorced. It's just weird. And even the timing of this, like, it didn't have, they were already divorced by the time Carrie had committed suicide. Uh, but the biggest omission of all is where the fuck is Chris Von Erich? And I know the directors talked about that he kind of made Mike in Chris an amalgamated character represented by Mike. But you can't fucking do that. They were two entirely different people. Mike kind of sort of was interested in wrestling, but was really pushed and forced by Fritz in some ways to get into wrestling 
in large part because he needed Fritz wanted somebody to replace David's spot. While they got you know a lot of the portrayal about Mike correct, like Mike was his own person, Chris has his own fascinating story about how he had asthma as a kid. He took asthma medication that they believe kind of stunted his growth. So you've got this five foot five kid that also, by the way, had brittle bones, but he actually wanted to get into professional wrestling. He wanted to be like his big, bigger brothers. He'd even tried to swell up like his bigger brothers, but it caused all types of issues. And to sit there and totally omit a brother from the story is inexcusable. Inexcusable. Because you also, like one of your big payoff points in this movie was Kerry Von Erich's suicide. Well, one of the contributing factors to Kerry Von Erich's suicide was also Chris's suicide in 1991. Like, what the fuck, movie? No. You can't just sit there and totally omit somebody. If him and David were in, or him and Mike, excuse me, were incredibly similar to where you really wouldn't notice, that's one thing. But Mike was like 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, he wasn't a dwarf by any means. Chris was 5'5". Five five. They had different experiences. They had to overcome different challenges to try and get into wrestling. They had different problems with their lives and different relationships with their dad and their brothers and to omit him was just obscene in my opinion it was why was mike important and chris not and if you say well you couldn't really fit him in then you really shouldn't have done the movie or i would say cut out some of the other shit and find a way to squeeze him in. He was too important to the story here. Like even when you're looking, at least they mentioned Jack Jr. and referenced Jack Jr. a couple of times in the movie, but you make absolutely no mentions or references of Chris at all? Fuck you, movie. That's the most glaring omission, and it's been getting a lot of shit and, it, and things talked about in reference to it, and it should, because that's just terrible. Now, you may say, man, that is a lot of inaccuracies. That is a lot of omissions. And you are tearing the other ever-loving shreds out of this movie. And to some degree, I am. But let me be clear. There are a number of things and key things that the Iron Claw got right. I thought the casting of David and Mike Von Erich was good. You know, while the guy that portrayed David wasn't six foot seven, he wasn't short. <laughs> right? Like, you would at least believe that this could be David Von Erich. And even though he didn't really look like a Von Erich, I could believe that Mike, the guy that portrayed Mike Von Erich was Mike Von Erich. Uh, the Mike Von Erich press conference, after he came back to the States, he had the toxic shock syndrome, you know, had the reported brain damage and dealing with the shoulder injury and all of that. That press conference was really well shown here because that's actually a piece that does hit on how big these guys were in the Dallas market in that time and how much of a big deal Mike's injury and health scare really was. They had a press conference for a reason. These guys were big effing deals. So they captured this really, really well. I personally thought the casting of Fritz Von Erich was great. Dude looks, looked just like Fritz to me. He didn't quite talk like him. He didn't have the raspy, like chain smoker voice of a Fritz Von Erich. But certainly when you looked at him and the way that he acted, you could suspend your disbelief. You could believe he was Fritz von Erich. It allowed me to emotionally connect with the story. I know some people are going to talk about they went too far in the portrayal of Fritz von Erich. A number of people saying they didn't go far enough. And I'm like, eh, I think it was okay. I don't think they omitted anything that was too necessary. I don't think they put in anything that was too unnecessary. Um, I thought they got it right. The casting of Harley Race was good, although I thought the Harley Race promo stuff was kind of, eh, that doesn't really sound like Harley. The way the guy that was portraying him moved and wrestled in the ring was fantastic. Outside of the hair looking different, like I, I, believe, I could believe that that was a Harley Race portrayal. Fritz ranking his kids was absolutely true. And you know, as much as people sit there and want to say that's terrible, you know, the reality is, is you have two types of people in this world or two types of parents in this world. Those 
that sit there and love certain kids more than others and the others that lie and say that they don't. That's bullshit. You cannot possibly love all of your kids just the same. That's just not humanly possible. And anybody to pretend otherwise is just full of shit. You're not fooling anybody. You're just lying to yourself. So Fritz sitting there, now perhaps it's a dick mood to sit there and be talking about how you rank your kids in front of your kids and how the rankings can change, but fuck it, at least he was honest about it. That I'll give Fritz. That I'll give him. Also, Chavo Guerrero, his portrayal of the Sheik, solid, but you could really feel his presence in terms of his consultation with the wrestling scenes and the wrestling sequences. These felt legit. These felt like real wrestling sequences, action moments, scenes, not just some shit that Hollywood threw together. Like you can believe it. And that's the most important thing when we talk about professional wrestling, right? Is that suspension of disbelief and getting you to be bought in and believe. And those wrestling sequences were really well done all throughout this movie. Uh, the portrayal of Fritz von Herrick, again, to me, is generally in line with the history. I know there are some elements you could sit there and say he was more this or less this. But it's kind of accurate, directionally speaking, and we'll take that. I also thought they did a pretty good job of capturing the four brothers' personalities and quirks kind of well. Um, David was believable and felt pretty true to life. Carrie certainly did outside of, you know, Jeremy Allen White being five foot seven instead of six foot two like Carrie was. Um, but, you know, kind of the fun-loving appetite for life approach of Carrie, the devil may care approach of Carrie, the very troubled personality of Carrie, him battling his demons. That was, that was really well done. You know, Kevin in terms of, you know, how he was the oldest living brother and kind of had a paternalistic um, protection over his other brothers, you know, kind of his go with the flow type of personality, even some of his lack of charisma at, on the microphone and such. You know, Mike was really well portrayed here. So I thought in general, the four brothers that they showed here were portrayed really, really well. Uh, the way David's death was portrayed is just kind of this random fucking thing that happens out of the blue was perfect. Like that absolutely measures up to real life. Now, granted, the way that they got the news back in the state side, back state side in 84 was different. They're getting calls from Japan in the middle of the night. And I believe it was David Manning uh, former ref and booker in WCCW that eventually had to tell Fritz von Erich that his son had died. But that's like one of those finite details that isn't as important. Just kind of the randomness of it, though, that's what matters more. Like, David goes to Japan and all of a sudden he's fucking dead. This movie hit a home run on that one. It really did. Even if it included kind of that BS postcard scene, you could deal with that because it was just so random. They also got right in terms of Kerry Atkinson being an elite high school and college discus thrower. He was a state champion in 1978 at the 4A level at Texas um, through like, I think it was 195 feet, seven inches, and later set an SC Southwest Conference record as a freshman. Uh, he was legit, you know, and they also captured the vibe at the time around the decision to boycott the 1980 Summer Olympics in Moscow. Like it's an incredibly unpopular move at the time. And, you know, there were a number of people that were working towards that Olympic dream. I did debate and dispute just how close Kerry Von Eric, Kerry Atkinson really was to being an Olympic level discus thrower. That said, it does represent the feeling and the vibe at the time when Jimmy Carter announces that, hey, in the summer of 1980, the U.S. will be boycotting the Moscow Olympics. It was one of many contributing factors that led to him getting landslid out of office by Ronald Reagan in the Reagan Revolution in 1980. When the only one you had the Iran hostage scandal, energy crisis here in the States, all of that. But one of the most unpopular things about Jimmy Carter was the decision to boycott the Summer Olympics in 1980. And this movie actually took time to put that in. I wonder if it really needed to be included in the grand scheme of things. Took up a couple of minutes that you could have, I don't know, maybe have used to put Chris Von Eric in there somehow. But they did it and they captured it right. They also captured it right both with Kevin and Carrie's pain as they lost several brothers. This was really well done and one of the highlights of the movie. Um, also, when it came to Carrie and his inevitable suicide, even though I talked about some of the inaccuracies with that, um, him committing suicide with the pistol he once gave his father Fritz, 
wasn't on Christmas, by the way. It was on Father's Day. Uh, but again, that's a time compression thing you could deal with. Um, the fact that you have that kind of full circle thing of he kills himself, shoots himself in the heart with the gun that he once gave his dad for Father's Day is a really painful piece of storytelling, a really painful piece of this story. And they absolutely nailed that here. Um, as I look at this movie overall, as, even as I'm watching it, and even before I went to watch it, I kept having this feeling, I really wish this could be a mini series or a full-on series on a Netflix, an Amazon, a Hulu. You could do anywhere from 6 to 13, 20 episodes, however many episodes you want, depending on how many layers of the Von Erich family story you want to tell. Um, there was so much more you could have told here. And I really would have wished, would have liked them to be able to tell so much more of the story and been able to take their time doing so. Like you could have started a series focusing on Fritz and his career. Like you don't even really touch on how Fritz von Erich, how, just how big of a star he was back in the day and what it meant for him to be portrayed as a, basically a Nazi, right? But a Nazi sympathizer in the 50s and 60s in post-World War II America and just how much heat that brought along with that and how hated he was and how big of a star he was in his time. Like you could do an episode or two of a series just highlighting some of the key moments in Fritz von Erich's career, which led to him eventually setting up shop in Dallas and getting involved in big time wrestling and eventually taking over the Dallas office, world class, etc. Like you could have a show or two before you even introduce any of the kids. If this had to be a movie though, I honestly, and maybe this is all, me always having been a Kerry Von Erich fanboy when I was a little kid and I still remain so to this day, um, I would have rather seen a movie about the modern day warrior Kerry Von Erich because you could have narrowed the scope just to him. You could have shown his career arc, his family relationships, his battles um, with addiction, his battles with the demons of his brother's death and all that that meant. Hollywood does better when they narrow their scope. And, it, and in some ways you could say, well, here, the scope was Kevin Von Erich. No, it was Kevin Von Erich and everybody else. Like, you really focus in on Kerry Von Erich, the modern day warrior. I think it would have been made for a better movie, in my opinion. And I'm sure others will disagree with me, and that's fine, right? Um, I will say this, though. Um, Zach Efron was fantastic in his portrayal of Kevin Von Erich. I feel like he deserves the awards buzz that he's getting because this was top notch shit. Now, I've seen some people opine and comment that they felt like he should have actually portrayed Carrie Von Erich. And I could understand that because he was actually a little too jacked in this movie to have been Kevin Von Erich. Kevin, Kevin was muscular back in the day, mind you, but he was like six foot two, 220 pounds or so. Um, he wasn't as cut as Zach was in this movie. I'll put it that way. So physique-wise, he was a little more reminiscent of Carrie than he was Kevin. But the way he portrayed this character, the way he captured the mannerisms, the attitude, the mindset, it was fantastic. And I hope he does get some award attention because it certainly deserved, in my opinion. Um, even with all of the inaccuracies and omissions I've talked about here in this movie, of which there were many and I did not even cover nearly all of them, you could still find yourself really connecting to the Von Erich tragedy. You could understand it. You might not be able to relate to it because how many people have sat there and watched all of their brothers die and have to live decades of their lives without them. But you could understand it to some degree. You could connect with it to some degree. You could feel Kevin Von Erich's pain. You could feel the pain of the others in the family, Fritz, Doris, the other kids as they're watching brother after brother pass away. You could feel all of that. And that's important because at the end of the day, that's what this story is about. It's about family. It's about loss and how you deal with tragedy. And you were able to get that from this movie. I feel conflicted saying as many, you know, things about the inaccuracies and omissions about this movie because this is really an underrepresented movie genre. Like pro wrestling has been a big part of American pop culture history the past hundred years. And it really doesn't get the representation that it does. And frankly, when it does get 
represented. It's associated with things like death. It's associated with things like Mickey Rourke's movie, The Wrestler, Randy the Ram. And, you know, those are the types of stories that seem to only get the attention. So I'm hoping deep down that other wrestling fans do go see this movie. It is totally worth your time to go see it. I hope this movie does enough box office to where it makes its money back and some profit. So that way, at some point in time, if another studio gets an idea to do another movie about some type of wrestling topic, you know, maybe a real Vince McMahon biopic, even if it's unauthorized, um, that you could sit there and make it work. That you could make money with it. So I am hoping the Iron Claw is successful. Ultimately, I think it does deserve to be, with as many inaccuracies and omissions that it, as it has, you still got the right sense, the right general theme about the Von Erich family story, the Von Erich family tragedy. And that's the impression that you should walk away from this movie with. It was something you could go, you could watch, and you could enjoy it as much as you can enjoy such a morbid story. Like, you could disconnect, unplug from reality a little bit, and just watch and see this really important story about professional wrestling history play out.